of our uh, District 2 uh, training and Q&A session. Uh, tonight's session is uh, we're going to talk about is working with aircraft and uh, and what uh, roles that uh, aircraft can do to support ground crews uh, and also uh, some intelligence gathering, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, before I introduce our uh, couple of guests tonight, which we've already touched on, I just want to uh, run through the acknowledgement of country. So the city of Greater Bendigo, where I am tonight, is on Jar Jar Rung country, whose ancestors and the descendants are the traditional owners of this country. We acknowledge their living culture and the unique role in this life of the region. So uh, from here, uh, just uh, tonight, I'd like to introduce Ian McRae. Uh, Ian, as I was for the people who were on last week, uh, he uh, supported uh, Brett Wagstaff around uh, our uh, strategy and tactics around grass fires. Uh, and I've asked Ian to come back on tonight uh, in his aviation role. And similar to other weeks, I'll get uh, him to uh, get, give a brief overview of what he does in the aviation space. Uh, the other guest presenter tonight is uh, Mike Carney. Mike is uh, uh, works in the aviation space as well. And of course, uh, he'll provide a uh, overview. Both these guys are part of a eight or nine person team that we've got in District 2. So we've got uh, five air attack supervisors that are volunteers and we've got three air observers plus a couple of uh, FRV slash XCFA staff members that play in the aviation space. Uh, my background is got involved in as an air observer, ground observer back in 20, uh, 2011, 2012, uh, and I've been um, supporting CFA in the aviation coordination role uh, for the last uh, three seasons. This is the uh, beginning of uh, season four for myself. And at the moment, uh, there's quite a bit going on, in, especially in regards to COVID. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ian. Are you on our line, Ian? Yes, mate. I'm here. Yep. Thanks, Ian. Um, thanks for coming on again. Just wondering uh, for tonight, if you could give uh, the uh, District 2 people just a bit of a brief or overview of what your roles are within the aviation uh, space. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ian McRae, obviously. Um, I have been playing aviation stuff for fire or fire suppression for probably close to 25, 30 years um, as uh, <clears throat> air observer, air attack supervisor, um, air ops manager and state aircraft coordinator. Um, I have spent um, a number of years now working in the, uh, the State Control Centre in Melbourne as the uh, uh, State Aircraft Coordinator. So I have a role to play down there in managing the allocation or the dispatch of aircraft to uh, any and all incidents uh, within Victoria. Um, and I guess part of all of that and where my background comes from as well is that um, I have had the opportunity to uh, participate in a number of uh, deployments overseas and interstate. So. Um, <clears throat> got a bit stuck behind me in terms of experience and uh, exposure to different situations, scenarios, um, vegetation types, all that sort of stuff, a lot of different aircraft types um, and can bring a bit to the table in terms of uh, how we might go about doing it. <clears throat> Fantastic, Ian. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Mike, uh, you're online. Thank you. Yeah, yeah g'day, Mike. Uh, just wondering if yeah. you could give uh, the District 2 people a bit of an overview on, on the role you play in the aviation space as well. Yeah, sure. I... When I first started the CFA back in the early 90s, I was targeted to start doing some air observing. So I started off uh, air observing, getting involved in District 14 uh, with the training. I uh, got an air base manager, aircraft officer, sort of moved up and was targeted for some air attack training back uh, in the early 2000s, I guess. Um, I sort of leapt from there and got involved in uh, the crane, deployed in interstate, uh, the same as Ian. Um, more professionally, like I'm a volunteer, but career-wise, I'm a commercial pilot and an aircraft engineer. So I've dabbled in aviation my whole working life, and I, I see those skills something that I have as a volunteer that I've given back to the CFA. And um, yeah, I enjoy doing it over the summer, and probably uh, you know it's um, it's a lot of value. And uh, I think that um, you know we 
talk about tonight, cover more ground, but um, that's pretty it from my background, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, for the people online, I'm uh, very privileged and lucky to have these two guys on tonight. Uh, I might be the coordinator, but uh, the aviation space is a is a very big, uh, it's a good, uh, solid team space, and we work really closely together, and it's great to have these sort of people on board with the aviation uh, knowledge behind them. So tonight what we've got is uh, we've got a couple of little slideshows. The first one is... Uh, is uh, regarding working with aircraft, and Ian and Mike and myself will uh, will work through that. Ian might uh, uh, kick it off as Michelle puts it up. So we've got someone that is uh, coordinating the slideshow, and then the second one is going to be working with uh, with Mike. Mike was uh, part of a uh, a uh, air attack supervisor and strategic plan uh, for a fire that we had uh, this year back in January in the uh, Masson Ranges or in the Coleman Group area of Pastoria. So we'll work through a bit of the scenarios with that. So, uh, yep, the first one, uh, the first slide show is um, getting the most out of aircraft. And I'd, it'd be remiss to uh, for me not to uh, thank Adam Damon from uh, the Mount Masson Brigade has uh, supported us tonight by uh, putting together uh, a little bit of a slideshow that we've, uh, we're have we using. So if you're happy, Ian, to sort of work through this, myself and Michael will uh, work with you. Yeah, sure. And I guess um, this is probably, um, as much as anything, probably the most Im important messages that um, I can relay to a lot of the guys that are actually putting the fire out, the people on the ground that are doing the hard work and uh, how you can best utilise and best um, uh, take to your advantage what the aircraft can contribute to what your uh, your strategies, tactics and objective might be. <clears throat> so what we'll talk about tonight, a uh, bit of an overview of some of the aircraft, what the roles are across the, uh, the team and how they all fit together and uh, <clears throat> a bit about PDD and how you go about managing that from a, uh, a perspective of the responding crews on the ground. Next one, Michelle. <clears throat> as a way of background as well, I guess what's available to us within Victoria, and these are numbers potentially from uh, uh, last year as well, and uh, we're still finalising what the, uh, the overall fleet will look like, but largely these numbers are fairly well correct. Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of resources available to us in terms of aircraft. Um, and uh, what happens is that as the season progresses from northwest to southeast, essentially, the aircraft are, um, are put onto or brought into service for their availability periods. The standard contract will be about 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. But there are some aircraft that have um, longer contract periods and depending on the season, potentially the uh, the contract periods may well be extended to uh, to cover us if we have um, a late summer or something like that and or fire conditions are such that we require the resources available to us. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a fair swag of fire bombing aircraft, which includes from uh, the large air tankers, um, the seats, the single engine air tractors, um, and our range of rotary helicopters or rotaries that uh, are based throughout the state. What we've done, uh, what the departments, the agencies have done over the last few years is certainly taken uh, an initiative to base the seats in teams of two. So you get uh, your bang for your buck. So rather than just getting one aircraft, normally in PDD, those aircraft will dispatch in pairs. Um, not the same with flats and things like that, but certainly the, the seats, that's the way it goes. And there are, to support all those fire bombing aircraft, a fairly significant fleet of um, uh, lighter aircraft and uh, specialist aircraft that are available to us, to you on the ground, to give you um, <clears throat> different resources for different tasks. You'll see on the slide there that talks about the, uh, the air attack supervisors and recce aircraft. Um, they're probably the ones that we see most often, but the AIG platform, the aerial intelligence or information gathering platform um, is, uh, and there's two of those, based out of Moorabbin and available basically uh, on any given day to be able to dispatch to uh, essentially any incident and give us some um, aerial information that um, frankly is gold for what they can produce. That includes not only uh, mapping information, but um, they are fitted up with uh, both infrared and uh, high definition cameras 
to provide live streaming of what the incident might be looking like, which can be uh, relayed back to the ground, either to the incident or to an ICC or wherever it might be. <clears throat> and all that sort of thing is going on uh, basically all through the season. Um, as well as that and where these aircraft operate from, there's um, the nominated operating bases, the knobs um, throughout the state from the far west uh, down through Casterton, um, Hamilton going all the way to the east into the, uh, uh, well, Benambra, Corriong or Albury more likely, um, Bairnsdale, places like that. So we've got the state covered. Um, there's not too many places where we can't get aircraft dispatched to an incident at reasonably short notice and have them uh, on scene within a reasonable amount of time. Um, Ian, Ian uh, and uh, Mike, Ian first. Uh, Ian, uh, around Bendigo and, and North, where are the nominated air bases, uh, say, uh, Bendigo North? <clears throat> well, um, yeah, obviously Bendigo. We're PDD here in Bendigo. There are aircraft based out of uh, Shebanon, Mangalore, Bacchus Marsh, Essendon, Ballarat, um, and to the west, Donald, um, probably are the ones that are most relevant to us. And uh, the stuff out to the west will be uh, shifted around, dependent on the uh, the harvest season that's going on at the time as well. So uh, we'll also have early in the, the harvest season aircraft based at um, Nil and at Oyen. <clears throat> so that's probably pretty much what we've got available to us around this part of the world. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, you know, that's it. Um, pretty slight, just a lot of the people that get involved in this, and this is probably um, a reasonable rep representation of the number of people that are performing different roles during an incident to support the aviation uh, component of the, the fire suppression. And that will range from um, all of the roles that we'll talk about, from air ops manager, aircraft officers, that sort of thing, through to uh, the guys on the air bases that are providing assistance, resources, supplies, um, loading bombers, all that sort of stuff that's going on, as well as um, just some logistical support. So running around, getting things organised. <clears throat> Pretty critical, I guess, to the whole exercise. Um, the people that are performing those roles, the pilot, somebody's got to drive. Um, normally in that scenario, we'll have an air attack supervisor who is working closely with the pilot to work out exactly what we're going to be doing and how we're going to do it. Uh, and the air observer, which is another unique role that fits into the whole perspective. The air attack supervisor will talk about a bit more and certainly the air observer in terms of what their role is and how they dovetail together. And then on the ground, the people that are supporting the whole operation, we'll have aircraft officers. Um, the air operations manager, which usually kicks in when the, uh, uh, the incident becomes larger, longer, more complex, um, the air ops manager will be somebody that kicks into, in, becomes a, a critical element in the, uh, the IMTs. On the ground, guys that actually do the mixing or the loading. So the mixing and the loader are two unique different tasks. Um, we need people to put the, uh, the stuff in the aircraft, um, certainly the seats, that is, the, the bombers. Uh, and the mixes are the guys that are producing or mixing the uh, the retardant products that we can displace, dispense around the place. And keeping all that together, the glue that holds the airbases together is the airbase manager, and they're keeping an eye on all the things that are happening around the airbase. So <clears throat> um, the aircraft officer is somebody that will initiate or they'll be um, usually on standby. If we have an IMT up on, set, set up, there will be an aircraft officer normally within that IMT that are available to um, uh, coordinate or at least manage the aircraft operations as they develop. Um, they're looking after all things aircraft from um, initially the tasking of the aircraft, liaising with operations to do that. Um, if the situation or the incident requires it, they'll be the ones that are um, sourcing additional aircraft for the incident controller. Um, and again, the part that we need to be mindful of with all of this is um, just what's happening with logistics. Big part of that is fuel, but uh, certainly how we go about um, supporting the aircraft operations on the ground 
is the major role that the aircraft officer will be looking at and spending a fair bit of time uh, pulling the threads together, working with logistics to make sure that all that happens. And again, the bigger picture, the um, they have the initial responsibility for making sure that uh, we're following all our operating plans, procedures, that sort of stuff, and uh, making sure that our uh, we're making the best use of the aircraft that we've got available to us. Um, what have I missed, Mike? Nope, sounds pretty good, uh, Ian. Sounds good. <clears throat> oh, you've covered it, mate, pretty well. That's all, all there. Very good. Next one, Michelle. <clears throat> so what's probably not... Um, it should be fairly obvious, but uh, not really talked about is that in the context of the aircraft operating, the pilot is the one that holds all the cards. They are the person in charge of the aircraft. And whilst an air attack supervisor might be working with the aircraft and providing direction to how they're going to go about supporting ground crews, it really is the pilot that's deciding, yes, I can or no, I can't, or I can do this for you to make sure that we're operating safely and that um, the aircraft are being operated within their performance parameters and um, they're looking after all things aircraft outside the aircraft as well. So looking for other aircraft, talking to other pilots, other you know, etc. Um, talking back to air control if necessary. All those sorts of things are the roles that the pilot fulfills. <clears throat> and as the slide says, pilot says no, that's what happens. Pilot says no, we don't do it. Um, <clears throat> they'll be doing all sorts of things from obviously maintaining the aircraft in the air, but running radios, keeping an eye on and supporting the air attack supervisor, all those sorts of things that are happening in the aircraft. Next one, Michelle. Um, Ian, just uh, on the, with the pilot, what's some of the reasons that a, uh, a pilot may not, uh, well, you may not be able to lift off the ground uh, uh, to be dispatched to a job and at a over a top of a job, what's uh, some of the reasons that they may uh, uh, say, no, we're not going any further or we've got to return to base? Yeah, look, obviously, weather is a critical consideration to the whole thing. Um, and uh, there have been a number of occasions over the last few years, probably going back 10 years, where the pilot has said, no, I can't do that. So um, certainly wind would have a major impact on uh, their ability to uh, uh, to take off and to operate. Um, it might be weather that's approaching. They'll be keeping an eye on all sorts of things like that as well. Mike, do you want to jump in here and give us your pilot's perspective on uh, some of the reasons why we, we will or won't be flying? Yeah, absolutely. You covered it, Ian. I think... Um Lee rotor turbulence is a big one, especially on Macedon ranges, anywhere where uh, there's a strong northerly, for example, and the fires on the south side. So a helicopter pilot, especially, they're sort of um, pretty susceptible to Lee rotor turbulence. The same with the fixed wing bombers, up with downdrafts. Um, as far as you look at Black Saturday, the Ericsson air crane, they have a starting limit where uh, we might want helicopters, but the wind speed is exceeding the start limit of the helicopter. So above about 50 knots, um, you can't start the Ericsson. So we can sit aircraft there, but the um, blade flapping that occurs as they start is a real limit. And so be really careful of that. Um, so it's covered. Yeah, frontal change is a big thing. Um, we like to be on the ground. And if we can, the best thing to do, as Ian said, is to, is to butt out. If there's a big wind change coming. People secure in the fire line. We do the same thing. We'll go and land sit down and wait for the wind change to come through, then go back. It's the best way we can conserve fuel resources. And it's much safer to do that. Uh, Mike, what about lightning? We get a lot of fires come through from the, the west and track through across the district, sometimes following, following the uh, the granite and the ironstone. Yeah. Uh, what about operating lightning? Absolutely not. We don't like lightning. Um, good thing in an aircraft, you see it coming a fair way off, so you can see the cells forming, um, whether it be, you know, cumulonimbus or pyrocumulus, so um, f weather generated from fires like we saw last year. So we're really, uh, really mindful of that, and um, there was a lot of that down towards Omeo and right around, and Ian will know that. The lightning strikes that show up when our tracking systems are quite, you know, intense, and we can get information from EMV and through the SAU, and the pilots as well will know weather, but yeah, we just keep our eyes open. We, we see something forming and we see lightning strikes to the ground, then we're gonna butt out. You know, it's about, 
you know, a lightning that's going to strike up to 20 miles from a big CB, you know, 15 miles. So uh, helicopters don't like that. There's lots of moving parts and things tend to weld together when you're hit by lightning. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And just one thing, yeah. you just used a acronym, SIU. What's that stand for? Uh, the State Aircraft Unit. Yep, yep. And they operate uh, out of Melbourne? At AMV, yeah, the State Control yep. Centre, where Ian knows that is. You can brief on that, but yeah. Yeah, well, that's a, that, that's a, basically Air Operations Headquarters where um, the, the teams for the day are picked and Ian knows that. He goes down there as Air Ops Manager and uh, they have a, a crew of people and they monitor the aircraft being dispatched and deployed. So when you request an aircraft you for the district, it goes to SIU. They look around what's available and um, they dispatch from wherever the best resources are. Um, and what's available and what's not delegated another fire or, you know, light trucks at stations, you know, we make sure we've got the coverage and we're backfilling. So we take something from one area, they can backfill with another aircraft from another area. Um, wind speed is a big thing. You know, people, we get wind speed of 50, 60 knots and some of our aircraft are only doing 100 knots. So if you ask for, you know, you've got a 50, 50 knot wind in, in, in kilometres an hour, 80, 90 k winds from the north to expect the Ericsson to come from Essendon, he's pushing that, that headwind to come all the way up. So while you might want it, it can take a bit of time to get here. Yeah, so, and he's burning fuel the whole time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and that's a good point, Q. You know, fuel's a big thing. So for us, and Ian can cover this, but, you know, 45 minutes from lift of working time, we need fuel. So the truck goes with the crane. So when the crane goes, the, the truck goes. So. Yeah, and I think uh, tonight there'll be some discussions. Some people are used to, I think PDD has been working extremely well across Victoria and everyone seems uh, comfortable with it now. But I think behind the scenes tonight, there'll be some, uh, when people ask for air support, uh, sometimes it does take a period of time to get it there. Uh, and I'm sure that um, yourself and Ian will continue to um, to work through that. Thanks, Ian. No worries, thanks guys. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> pardon me. The role of the air attack supervisor, and I guess Mike and I can talk uh, ad nauseum about the role and uh, what's involved in being an air attack supervisor. Um, <clears throat> they are largely in charge of what's happening in the air in the context of how we go about assisting the guys on the ground to put the fire out. The air attack supervisor doesn't run the fire. That's the, uh, the job of the guys on the ground. <clears throat> but they have always had a critical role to play in working out how they can contribute to the objectives and the strategies and tactics that are going on on the ground to actually suppress, pull up, um, protect areas, whatever it might be, um, to help the guys on the ground actually put the fire out. It's a major liaison role between the ground and the, uh, and the air. And to be honest, it is a source of constant frustration to be able to work our way through the comms sometimes to be able to get that effective communication happening. Um, <clears throat> what happens on a fire ground, you will be well aware, is that things get very busy. There's a lot of, uh, lot of radio traffic um, and from the air, we can see a lot of the things that are going on and don't need to be told, um, nor do we need the communication from, uh, from the ground. So it's a fairly busy workspace and we, uh, we're managing a number of different radios and there'll probably be a slide a bit later on in the presentation to give you some idea of just what's going on in the aircraft. So if you're struggling to keep up with uh, or catch up with an air attack supervisor to get some advice or discussion with him, it's probably because they're fairly busy. Um, the air attack supervisor's role is to direct the bombing aircraft consistent with the strategies, tactics of what's going on on the ground. So <clears throat> the pilots that are flying the fire bombing aircraft are very good at what they do, very, very good. But their job is to fly the aircraft and to put whatever it might be, whether it's water foam, retardant, etc., where we need it on the ground. And it's the job of the air attack supervisor to be providing that information, that direction as to what they're actually doing and how they go about doing it. Obviously, because we've got a bird's eye view, no pun intended, um, we can provide some fairly valuable insight into just what the fire is doing, what sort of behaviour that might be uh, not visible to the guys on the ground. We can be looking ahead of where the fire might be travelling, tracking, looking at assets, looking at potential issues, um, even access for ground crews to get uh, get to a particular point. All that sort of stuff is uh, stuff that the air attack supervisor can contribute. Um, <clears throat> I think without exception, all of the guys now that are uh, air attack supervisors do have a fairly significant uh, operational role and experience. And uh, a lot of that comes from actually being on the ground and getting in the smoke and the dirt as well. 
so they're not just um, uh, glossy flyboys with uh, uh, Ray-Ban sunglasses. They've actually been there and done the walk as well with, with the, the guys on the ground. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that just, as the slide suggests there, one of those elements that is worth considering is when aircraft are involved, treat them as a sector. Um, as you might, uh, certainly for those that are running a fire, um, bite the different elements of the fire up into different uh, different sectors and treat them that way as to how you go about managing them. Next one, Michelle. Thank you. The Air Observer role is, um, I think, an under-recognised, under, uh, un not undervalued, certainly, but uh, a lot of people don't understand what the Air Observer might be doing or contributing to the whole picture. Within the AIMS structure, the Air Observer doesn't actually work in the aviation unit. They work for the planning unit. And their role is to provide any information and intelligence back to the incident management team on what's going on. Having said that, however, they can and do and should be talking to the guys on the ground about what they can see and giving real time advice on the same sorts of things that the air attack supervisor might be seeing as well. The way they'll operate is normally at a higher level, elevation of the ground than the air attack supervisor. So we'll set it up in different levels. The bombers will be down low, they'll be down where the hard work is being done. The air attack supervisor just above them, so they get a good perspective on what the bombers are doing. And the air observer will be up higher than that, so they get the really big picture things of what's going on. If they need to get closer, they'll talk to the air attack supervisor and the bombing aircraft and they'll ask for permission to come down. And working with all the pilots, we can make that happen. But um, they'll be the ones that producing maps, photos, voice messages, all that sort of stuff that's going back to the incident management team. Again, I think we might touch on it a bit later on, but um, one of the tools that's available from the aircraft these days are tablets, which have not only a mapping capability, but certainly can provide real-time photographs back to the ground on just what is happening um, and available to essentially anybody that's got the wherewithal or at least the tools to be able to um, uh, to capture that information. And certainly worth asking from the, the ground perspective, if you know there's an air observer or whatever around, ask them a question. Their, uh, their job is to provide that advice. Uh, Ian, before we move on, I've got a question from Robert asking, do we run air attack supervisor or air observer in Bendigo? Uh, we've got the capacity to run both and on stand up days, we will uh, generally have both available to us. Uh, the air observer might well be doing reconnaissance work before an incident, um, looking for smoke and anything else that might be going on, keeping a bird's eye view on the, uh, the district. Um, but if we have an incident, it's very likely that both the air observer and the air attack supervisor, together with the bombing aircraft, will be airborne and providing whatever information and uh, direction they can from the air. Uh, and just another one before we move on as well from Sam, who put one up much earlier, and you may cover this a bit later. Um, with aircraft, aircraft requiring a fire ground channel as soon as possible, um, why don't we have pre-allocated channels on the pager messages? Like the uh, look, there are, but importantly for the dispatch, certainly the dispatch, um, the aircraft, the, the responding aircraft, certainly in PDD, will be waiting to hear what the fire ground channel is. And um, certainly if the crews on the ground are within proximity to the fire, the information that can be gained in terms of how the aircraft can contribute to the, uh, to the, the suppression acti activities is gold, to be honest. So whilst it can become very busy and very distracting in the air to be listening to ground channels, um, if the need arises, there are channels that are available to us to dedicate to aircraft. Um, and simplex stuff so that we can actually talk to the ground without having to um, uh, wait for our turn with all the other traffic that's going on on the ground. <clears throat> but I stress that um, the responding brigades, when they establish a fire ground channel and start to communicate about what the activities are going, what's going on, what they can see, um, that will also be an opportunity for both the air attack and the air observer 
to be communicating with the guys on the ground on those channels to let them know what they can see. <clears throat> um, the airbase manager, as I said before, touched on that before. Uh, they're back at the airbase. They're making sure from a logistical perspective that they're supporting all the teams. Um, big role they play is keeping an eye on the uh, the operations collectively and making sure that everybody's doing things safely and that uh, those that are involved airside and being involved around the aircraft are um, competent, trained, capable of operating safely and, and effectively in those sort of scenarios. They're located on site. Um, they will be dispatched normally once the incident starts so they can support the aircraft. PDD, the aircraft will go without the, uh, the, the ground crews being there initially, but um, once things get going and they, the pilots can uh, simply land, load, respond back to the fire again, and the ground crews are the ones that are doing that. The um, <clears throat> fuel is an interesting one. Most of our contract aircraft these days are contracted to provide their own fuel. Uh, and as Mike said earlier, fuel is a major consideration where we have it, where we need it, how much we've got, um, and what the longer term uh, requirements might be is something that um, the airbase managers will be all over in terms of what's what's going on. Uh, I mean, just a quick question around the uh, fuel at the Bendigo Airbase. Uh, is it is there a fuel uh, trailer or truck on standby uh, at at these nominated airbases? Look, uh, as I said, most of the aircraft these days are wet A, wet B. It's just in terms of their contract as to what fuel they might have available. Bendigo rely on the uh, the Bowser for the light helicopter, so 305. They'll fuel from the uh, from the Bowser at the airport. Helitech 335 has its own fuel truck, and depending on how far away we are and how long the uh, the incident might take, the truck would follow the Helitech out there and find an appropriate place where they can support the uh, the aircraft with fuel. And uh, what about, uh, Mike, down your part of the world, uh, if you're operating in the Masson Ranges uh, part of the world, is there anywhere you can pick fuel up if you need it before the truck arrives? Limited here with jet fuel. Um, Avgas is no problem, but we don't use that. So kerosene, jet fuel, yeah, no, normally with we go to Kyan Airfield for Masson yes. Ranges Cobors. Um, that's the best. Airport's always the best to operate from, the safest um, for the, the obviously pilots and air operations. And the truck can be there uh, well within a fuel cycle for us. So as soon as 335 departs, um, we make a decision very early, pretty straight away, uh, trunk the truck, the, the pilot will or we will, and say go. And we talk to the SAU, the air desk, and say we're going to make the air base at Kyneton. And we send a truck straight there. So by the time we get out to Cobors, Masson Rangers, the truck's at Kyneton set up, waiting with his hose out, we land, and we can do 305 and 335. 335 will burn a lot more gas, uh, obviously in 305. So he'll do about two cycles to our one fuel cycle, maybe you know two and a bit. So yeah, right. Um, yep. But, we can, but really, we can go anywhere here. You know, if, um, yep. further afield, we might pick. You know, um, out towards uh, between you know Chuka and Bendigo, a paddock somewhere where it's got access to a road. We make that the airbase. You know, logistically. Put the, put the fuel where um, it's close to the fire and the turn times aren't so long to get there back and forth to the fire. Fantastic. And the other one, Mike, is you touched on uh, both of you are um, air attacks for the crane. Um, what would be the nominal operating time frame roughly for the cranes coming out of Melbourne if they're coming up into a northerly and it's 35, 37 degrees? What time would we get to have them on the ground before they start looking for a bit of fuel? <clears throat> Uh, again, probably more no more than that, but by the time they get the call to go, they take a bit longer to crank up than 335. They've got a lot of checks to go through. The aircraft are checked every morning. They they start up the APU and power it up and make sure everything works. But still, it's a big machine to get going, a lot of checks to run. So they'll sit there for a few minutes to get airborne. Um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of those guys, uh, they're, they're uh, from, you know, United States, uh, Canada, all over the world. And so they rely on the air attack to give them directions as well. So we'll go with them together. And we'll all lift together and go. Um, and so, you know, like I said, you're pushing a you know, 60k headwind coming up towards Bendigo. It, it potentially could take them about, you know, 30, 35 minutes to get from Essendon to Bendigo, maybe a bit longer. Yep. So, you know, you can, 
you need to make the call early and you know that Hugh, you know, when we see jobs, you know, and we, we and Ian will back up on this, if we get a job and we rely on one helicopter, there's a very real chance a mechanical machine, they have problems and you have one machine there and I'll make a decision. This is why, you know, we can't stop with one aircraft or make a call early to you to say we're not going to stop with one. Let's send something else. And maybe something from Ballarat, might be something from Essendon to support. And that, you know, that's really, um, it's easy like trucks. Get them on the road, we can always send them back, you know. Yes. Um, and, and look, I suppose over the uh, summer for the people online, uh, over, the, over the previous summers, as Mike and Ian are indicating, uh, things that uh, the RDO may do or a commander in the field may trunk the air attack supervisor and we have direct contact. And from their position, they've got a really good overview of what the fire is doing. And if it's in stringy bark and it's in the mass and ranges, um, we try and get some extra support en route. Um, understanding it could take... 35, 40 minutes, or it may take longer as it may have to come from journey across the state due to yeah. fire activity. And that's right, Hugh. You know, one thing that people need to be aware of too, you can call Firecom in the old Vic Fire and say, hey, you know you're on your page, you've seen Firebirds being deployed, ask Firecom to, to ask us what we're seeing. And we leave Bendigo and I can see a plume, you know, at Heathcote uh, Airborne out of Bendigo and, you know, you might be, we, you know, Brigade might have sent three trucks or asked the three to five trucks. So I can tell you from there, make it 15 or 20. You know, our size up can be very early. So we can get airborne size up fairly quickly that um, you're going to need more than just uh, potential what you're looking at. So, and especially over the fire, and you can cover this again, sizing up our recchio, we can see exposures. Um, we can give you a really good feedback quickly on what's going on. And um, what we, we think we can't tell you what you need, but we can give you some guidance that you're going to need more or less, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great points, great points. All right, back to the script, I guess. <clears throat> um, the fixes and loaders, we've talked about that really, but uh, their role is to, um, to fill the aircraft and to mix the product that they're putting into the aircraft. So, um, uh, one of the things that's available to us now, certainly from being used for the, the large air tankers as well, is a mobile base. Um, and it's a contract um, supplier that has a mobile mixing facility. And uh, usually within about 12 to 24 hours, uh, they can have a facility basically anywhere in the state that can produce retardant. Um, and doesn't rely on our mixed, but mix, oh, sorry, our fixed bases where they, they do retardant from, and those would be uh, Stall, um, Mansfield, Bansdale, the Trobe Valley. Um, where else have I forgotten, Mike? But anyway, they're places where we can mix retardant in a fixed facility, um, but we've got a, a capability now of um, actually having it mobile and taking it to uh, a lot of other different places. These ground guys as well are not only mixing the product, but they're responsible for the quality control. So um, depend on the water supplies that they might be using, uh, how the retardant's being mixed, what the product looks like, and how effective it's going to be on the ground. It's up to them to be making those minor adjustments to the mix to make sure that we're getting the, uh, the best bang for our buck. <clears throat> um, managing CDD. Um, look, I think everybody now has got a pretty fair handle on PDD. It's, um, as Hugh said earlier, it's working very well. It's a major leap forward um, in the way we actually respond to fires. Um, beyond the fact that they've got wings, the uh, the aircraft or whatever are um, simply another fire uh, resource that rolls out the door when the pager message goes. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where uh, the aircraft will get the message the same time as the brigade will, and it's probably as important for the brigade to understand their local conditions, their local vegetation or fuel types, um, and where the fire might be as to whether or not an aircraft is going to be required. And again, incumbent or responsibility for the brigades responding to be making that um, early decision about whether they actually need the aircraft or not. Um, and good question, they will or should hear, because we're all on the same channels, we're all talking to Firecom, that the aircraft are responding. If you don't hear that, it's a good opportunity to ask the question, are aircraft responding to this incident? 
No, it's worth saying, I'll just uh, quickly jump in. Uh, for people that are online, um, I'm sure they're aware, once the fire danger period hits, uh, there will be uh, a sea response or three brigades and air support uh, for every Code 1 grass and scrub fire. That doesn't mean that the aircraft is coming, is it, Ian? Uh, no, it doesn't. So some triggers that need to be hit, and I'm sure that... Uh, and Michael touch on it, triggers need to be hit. Uh, also, the, the machines may be deployed at another job, but you will continue to get it come up on your pager that uh, that uh, PDD platform has been responded. So what's some of the triggers that uh, needs to be hit uh, for air support? Well, in this part of the world, it's probably um, certainly north. It's uh, We rely on grassland FDIs as well. Um, so 12 is the critical number. Um, so if the FDIs are 12 or above, then the aircraft can respond to PDD. If uh, we haven't reached that trigger point, it will then be the normal requirements for dispatch of aircraft. So a, uh, a brigade that's responding to an incident and they think they need the aircraft, they need to be talking to the RDO and requesting the aircraft. The RDO can then go to the air desk at the State Control Centre and say, aircraft please. And um, that's an opportunity for those aircraft to be dispatched might put a perspective there as well from an air desk perspective. I get to see that or get to play that game. The question is when we get a call from an RDO or whoever and say we need aircraft, we might well get, and I'll use Bendigo as an example, an RDO might ring up and say send 335. The question from an air desk perspective might be what do you need, not what do you want. So rather than asking for a number, you simply ask for resources and we might well, from an air desk perspective, be sending stuff from Mangalore, from Ballarat, or from Bacchus Marsh, or Essendon, um, and responding aircraft to um, to the incident as well. So we can make a line call, basically a judgment call, about um, what the incident might look like, what the weather conditions are doing, what the resources might be needed, etc., and uh, provide that assistance both to the incident and to the RDO about what we can do for you. <clears throat> um, the air attack supervisors, we've talked about those, but um, there'll be one on roster in Bendigo throughout the uh, the PDD period. Um, there are aircraft running PDD out of Bacchus Marsh and Mangalore as well, but there's no air attack supervisor based with those aircraft. The same would be said potentially for um, Shepparton. Again, we've had aircraft over there. Um, without an air attack supervisor. And likewise, uh, the stuff out the west, so Donald, Helitac out there, doesn't have an air attack supervisor with it. So in this part of the world, to get an air attack supervisor, we're looking for Essendon, sorry, Essendon, Bendigo or Ballarat. <clears throat> As I said before, have a think about whether it's, is it coming? Do we need it? Do we turn it around? Um, and uh, when you're making that call, yes, we need it. As I said before, by nominating a fire ground channel that you can communicate on from a ground perspective, Firecom will be advising the incoming aircraft of what the fire ground channel is, and they will be listening to that to get in front of the game as well. Um, <clears throat> The aircraft configuration, probably not you, you would never get to see, but basically in the aircraft there are obviously a suite of radios and communication tools that we have available to us, which can make it an extremely busy workspace. Um, there'll be a trunk radio, there'll be a uh, trunk simplex radio, and two airband radios. Now the airband radios are, no, that's not quite right. One airband radio is certainly the pilot's domain. The second one is shared between the air attack supervisor and the pilot and will generally be tuned to a channel that the air attack supervisor can talk directly to the firebombing aircraft without having to get, I won't say bogged down, but certainly tied up in all the traffic that's happening on the ground. <clears throat> um, the trunk radio stays on the trunk radio because we rely on it for um, uh, the rats or the, uh, the tracking systems that go with it. Uh, so when you can see on a, on a screen, if you have available to you, where the aircraft are, that information is being relayed through uh, through the trunk radio, strings of information that come through there, the data. 
And um, <clears throat> the simplex radio would normally be tuned to the fire ground channel or to a nominated aircraft channel that we can use to talk to the, uh, the ops officer on the ground or whoever else we might need to. Um, Ian, I've got a couple of questions for you. Is that all right? Yeah, go. Yeah, please. So uh, is there any development yet or uh, in the pipeline to improve comms between aircraft and the ground? It has been quite difficult at times in the past. Look, I'll, I'll challenge that to some extent. I understand exactly where they're coming from by the question. The challenge in communicating with the aircraft is not about better equipment or better technology. It's about systems and processes. Um, again, you know, we uh, quite regularly get bogged down with the amount of traffic, radio traffic that's coming through in the aircraft. We're listening to other aircraft, itinerant aircraft that might be going past potentially that uh, might be coming over the radio, um, talking to the fire bombers, listening to the trunk radio, having to do our flight following through trunk radio or whoever we might be doing that, um, providing the direction to the other bombing aircraft and having the ground traffic as well. And what happens normally, I will suggest, is that the guys on the ground that are operating on a fire ground channel are trying to communicate with the aircraft on that channel and the air attack supervisor or whoever has probably turned it down so that they can do all the other stuff they need to be doing at the time as well. Is that a fair call, Mike? It is, and there's a reason for that, Ian, you sort of touched on it. Um, and it's about timing. You know, we uh, we can have three things going at once and you cannot, you span a control, you can't listen to three radios and have a trunk call coming in and everyone's important. They all want to be talked to. Uh, for us, the aircraft separation is a big thing and our workload is cyclic. It, it peaks and troughs. Uh, it peaks when we're dropping. So if there's a bombing run or a heli tack working and it's doing a drop, don't try and call us. If the heli tech departs a fire to go for water, we'll go back on the ground and turn it back up and have a listen. So that's the time you guys want to jump in and key the mic and um, get hold of us because we'll, and if we haven't, we'll instigate it. If I haven't heard from anyone on the ground for a while, I'll jump back on the ground and I'll say, everyone happy, we're doing the right thing. Do you want anything different? Um, and you know, quite often it's the reverse too. We won't hear from anyone. It can be very frustrating for us because the channel we've been given uh, may not be the one that you guys have decided to flick over to. So as Ian touched on earlier, if you change channels, decide to change channels, let Firecom know and let us know because we'll sit there for minutes and minutes calling. We get we get worn out, you know, trying to talk and it's a, it's the same for us. We'll just key off and, um, you know, turn it down and try a bit later on. But, you know, the communication issues, it, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street, you know, um, uh, we'll give you as much as we can if um, you give us a time and it's especially if there's a drop a dropping run or a bombing run going on we're pretty busy so yeah. i reckon uh, mike just to value add um, as well uh, from my perspective if we need to go out to a job and it's an escalating it's gone to a level two uh it's going to have sectors put in etc we'll uh look uh similar to uh what was uh, put up before as part of the slideshow uh part of the sector will be the air <coughs> and we'll uh we'll get the uh aircraft uh, onto a separate channel, so you're not listening, or potentially not listening to all the fire ground trucks uh, chattering amongst themselves and talking about what their uh, their sad status and situation is, and that just makes it a lot easier if we can uh, either trunk you or just talk directly to the air attack supervisor and get that real live uh, intel. So the things that we try to do, we talk about sectorising the fire ground. Uh, once we go to a level two job, and especially into a level three, we need yep. to we need to get that dedicated aircraft channel. So you guys aren't listening to all the trucks and all the information on the ground, but we can get that real info, real Trun intel. Trunk's good, Hugh, and the reason for trunk is good. In, in, you know, you guys use it, but um, it's good because the pilot monitors that as well. He won't listen to the ground, but he'll listen to the trunk. And as a trunking call, we get a poke. You know, you got a trunk call, and we'll see it. And we can sort of ditch what we're doing potentially with the aircraft VHF stuff and go straight to the trunk. So it's a good medium uh, communication line for us, especially for you and uh, for the state aircraft unit. And I suppose, Mike, another one just for uh, people that are in the position at an FOV or an FCV and they're trunking you is to really think about the uh, the, the conversation they're going to have prior to talking to you. Um, you know, think about it. Think about Absolutely. The, you need to find out the info. And Absolutely. Then Sorry, you absolutely. And and be concise. You know, get what you want together 
put it together in a short script, have someone communicate the message. Don't be disappointed to get cut off because we might have a lats come in or a crane coming for a drop and we'll just end the call and we don't even get time to say sorry, but we'll just end it. You might have to call us back um, because we have to go straight to VHF. There could be an aircraft separation issue or the drop might be in the wrong direction. We might see us, you know, maybe ground crews in the ground. We need to get, get a hold of people. So, you know, uh, while we try and give you the the total commitment to talk to you all the time, it may be that we have to flip off and go and do something else quickly. But call us back. Certainly, trunk's good. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Mike, just while you're there, we've got another question that's come in, um, and I'll just pose it, Michelle. It's from Linda. Uh, if an aircraft's committed at a job, uh, does another one automatically step up to that airbase? No. No. Yeah. It's short answer. Um, look, we, we from certainly from an air desk perspective, we are monitoring all the time our capacity to respond to different areas. And uh, if we, or if an aircraft is dispatched to an incident from a uh, nominated base from a knob, um, we'll be looking at the weather, the potential, uh, how long it might take to get another aircraft there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there have been times when uh, we have dispatched an aircraft for an extended period to another location. And we've all seen it with 335 going to the east over the last couple of years with some of the major fires and uh, we have had the opportunity to backfill Bendigo for example uh, for a short term with other aircraft but certainly from an incident to incident um, we don't shift the aircraft around because where we take it from might well be exposing them to a different uh, set of risks as well so we fight the fire we've got and uh, we'll deal with the next one as it, as it occurs. Um, and also, and there's a, another question from Marcus. Telstra is turning trunk off. Will aircraft still have trunk? So he may be aware of uh, trunk being turned off. Yeah, look, trunk, uh, my understanding is that it won't be turned off immediately and there are certainly contingencies that are being considered and uh, that element of how we operate um, is part of the longer term um, communications plan that the agencies have to manage. Um, so right now, wouldn't worry about it, um, but it's something part of the future planning. Just go back to that previous slide, Michelle, if we could, just for a minute. Adam's done a magic job of showing you something there. If uh, those that are watching the screen there can see the uh, that that slide, that box in the middle with all the uh, the buttons and dials on it, essentially is the uh, the workplace of the air attack supervisor, and uh, those little white knobs across the top of that uh, centre box there. Uh, how we go about selecting which radios we can hear and which ones we can um, turn off any given time. So there's, uh, there's five buttons there, so five different radios. There's obviously options to do other things. And uh, we can only transmit on one at a time. So the big white knob, um, there's two of them, one for the pilot, one for the air attack supervisor. We control which channel we might be talking on. And as Mike suggested earlier, the pilot, for example, might well turn off the radio with the ground channels. The air attack will still be listening to it, but the pilot won't be. And similarly, an air attack might well turn off the uh, the pilot's aviation radio, is VHF, because we don't need to get involved in air traffic control. So with um, Melbourne Radio and places like that and talking to them about um, SAR times and, and things like that. So we can manipulate what we can and can't listen to or do and don't want to listen to. Um, but I've been in many, many, many situations where that button is running red hot, where we're flicking between channels to communicate to different people about different things. Um, so just to give you an idea of what's going on. Back to the slides, Michelle, please. Um, again, I think we've spoken about this, uh, probably nailed it down. Um, to get the comms established, get some consistency about it, um, get your fire ground channel sorted um, and have a way of getting in touch with the aircraft without having to deal with all of the fire ground traffic is uh, a bit significant benefit in how you go about running it. I have a fair bit of empathy from the guys on the ground because I've actually been in an FCV as well where we're trying to run a fire and talking to all the trucks. <laughs> and um, trying to talk to aircraft as well. So I get it from both ends. Um, it is a challenge from time to time, but it's about planning. It's about setting up some systems and uh, making sure that you've got the, uh, the tools that you have available working for you to the best they can. 
on, on communications, Ian, just one thing is um, do, do people need to be mindful too when they ask an air attack um, to go and take a look at something that possibly we're busy doing other things. And, you know, you've got the Arabs of a platform to do that. So it may be that we're not ignoring you. You might want to go you know, look at the western flank or something. We might be doing some stuff down at the head of the fire. So don't be disappointed if we don't do that you know we've got other priorities to do and we're not an air observer platform we certainly we can give you a size up and get around and have a look but specific things to go and look at can be difficult for us yeah <clears throat> yeah i think we've talked about that one michelle um i guess that first point there on the slide is probably the critical bit that from a ground perspective you need to be aware of the air attack supervisor isn't running the incident. They're working for the incident. And their job is to mix and match with the objectives, the strategies and tactics that are being employed on the ground to actually put the fire out. The aircraft don't put the fire out. I made that point last week as well. Um, but we can make it a hell of a lot easier for the troops on the ground to actually get to the fire and do what they do best as well. What the air attack supervisor is doing is managing the aircraft, the tactical aircraft in the air for the incident. <clears throat> um, yeah, and what we can see from the air obviously is an entirely different perspective to what you might be seeing on the ground. Um, you might be dealing with terrain, you might be dealing with vegetation, you might be dealing with smoke. And the air attack supervisor can give you some red hot, no pun intended, intel on just what the fire might be doing in mm. places where you can't actually see. And and again, the air attack supervisor might prioritise something that you can't see when you're expecting to be doing something. The air attack supervisor go, no, I'm going to do this and go and tear off and deal with an issue that they can see that you might not be aware of. Yeah, that's very true and exactly right. And I think to, to add there is, um, spot fires um, don't be afraid to if you go into a job and you know you're the crew leader of the truck you may be no officer there you're the crew leader and you're getting access to paddocks and cutting fences and gates and trying to get in don't be afraid to say to the aircraft do what you need to do go for asset protection go to the head of the fire uh, we can do that we don't need to have your your input on what you want us to do we can go to work straight away and you know help you out fairly quickly without um, you worrying too much, about, too much about what's going on, uh, where to put us. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Mike, I think you've touched on there that was identified to me earlier in uh, my uh, career of firefighting was uh, that uh, if the fires disappeared over the hill or out of your vision uh, and the air attack supervisor says, what do you want us to do? If they bomb the head of the fire and protect assets as they come under threat, they'll yeah. go to all day. Yeah. So um, that's the advice that I would give uh, people on, on air tonight. If you can't see where it's going, um, they've got some great yeah. intel, but you guys will uh, will do that all day long. And the Pastoria fire is a good one here. And we're going to talk about that later on, but I think the Pastoria fire was a good example where we disappeared. The fire was up the hill and Ian was there. So Ian and I were there together. Ian brought the crane up for Essendon. Um, and it was, it was the job I went to. And I said, Ian, you look after the hill because it was where the spotting was being generated from. And we went for the grass fires and with the ground crews working and we, we pretty well just targeted the spot fires and the slip ons were coming in to back up to support us as we knocked down each of the spot fires and the paddocks. And I think that's what really probably help pull that fire up yeah and i suppose uh, mike and ian at this stage um we, we've got some tasking and and some, a bit of safety stuff but just um how does the air attack supervise with uh the radios the comms um what uh, how many how many heli or seats can you work with uh at one time so uh if you if you've got 335 you've come down as um uh, as the air attack supervisor, we need some extra gear like we we sometimes do in the Masson Ranges on hot windy days. Uh, what's what's the span of control, or if we can? Depends on how unlucky you are here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think one mine, the biggest one, and Ian to support this, I was at Grampians years ago, and I think I had two cranes, and I reckon what was out of Vic, Vic Valley, I think six seats, probably two cranes and six seats, and every time I looked around, there was another another fixed wing bomber coming at me and two two Ericsson. So it's about five safely. And then we need to, you know, five is sort of depending on experience too. Uh, yes. 
for too long. Yeah. And, and with that, Ian, uh, or, Anne, or sorry, Mike, uh, and but Ian as well, is there a difference? Uh, does it add complexity working with uh, seats and Halitax or Rotaries uh, on the same job? Absolutely. No, it's, I'll jump in. Okay, Mike. sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it, it's complex, absolutely. But how you go about managing that is about what's happening on the fire ground, and they are not exclusively uh, um, you know separate as well. The, uh, the helitax or the rotary aircraft can work with, with the seats. What we generally do is put the seats to work on a particular sector or area of the fire and the rotaries on another um, and uh, the over the top keeping an eye on how they're all working together. Um, to be honest uh, and talk about how complex things are, um, I was air attacking with the large air tankers with the LATS at Mount Buffalo this last season looking after the chalet up on top of the, the, the mountain there. And we had two lats, a news helicopter, seven, I think it was seven, um, medium helicopters, um, all working in the space at the top of Mount Buffalo. Um, so it's all possible, it's busy, um, but again, it stresses that thing about effective communications, making sure everybody knows what they're doing, they're sticking to the tasks, they're going through their own, uh, we're using the, the agreed flight paths. Um, it can all happen, um, and it's just a matter of making sure that we uh, have some processes to manage it. And, uh, yeah, with, the, with the seats, uh, a pro the air trap, there's approximately what, about 3,000 litres of, uh, of uh, water retardant on board. Can they split the loads? Could they, uh, could they uh, uh, drop half and, and then come back and do another, another run? Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things that um, uh, is a, <clears throat> a tactic or whatever that, um, that we can use. Um, we can split loads. We can uh, do string drops. We'll basically restrict the load so that if you wanted, to, and a grass fire is a great example of that. If you had a, a running grass fire, and rather than giving a full salvo and just pushing the button, letting the lot go in one, one hit, we can either split the load, so do half and then come back and do another one, or we can restrict the load and only open the doors halfway and extend the load so that you're getting a greater coverage, a longer coverage, but not as heavy. So we can do all those sorts of things. It's a matter of um, uh, making sure that we, the air attack is telling the pilot just what we want. And uh, with the seats, Ian, uh, I suppose uh, uh, airspeed is uh, one thing, but once they've dropped, they've got to return to their uh, to the airbase to re reload, and turnaround time can be stretched out, especially on uh, fast-running grass fires. Look, absolutely. But again, that's what I said earlier. These days we send them out in pairs. So you're not just getting one load, you're getting two. How we go about supporting those in the longer term is going to be um, uh, something that we work on. And uh, looking at opportunities for supporting the seats rather than having them return to their nominated base is a consideration for the future. And looking at what we might have locally around central Victoria, Mike mentioned Kyneton. Um, you could run through the list, you know, you go to Maryborough, you go to Sanana, we can certainly go to Kerrang, places like that now, um, and significantly reduce the turnaround times that uh, it would take for a seat to uh, put a load out and then go and reload, return to the fire. So. And a, re a really positive uh, action last year was the, the training of uh, bomber loaders up in District 20 uh, by yourself and uh, Luke Waterson. And uh, as I said, uh, that's, uh, I believe that was CFA people uh, last year trained up uh, for bomber reloading. Yeah, it was. We, uh, we did 13, I think, um, people up there at Kerrang to uh, uh, bring them up to speed to load aircraft. So that was a good outcome. Um, look, the other point I'll make, just while you're talking about turnaround times and effectiveness and all that sort of stuff, if uh, the firefight looks like it's going to need uh, a number of loads from a seat to pull something up, ask for a lap. Um, they're just a bigger aircraft. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's all those sorts of options that are available to us and certainly considerations through the air desk about how we go about uh, providing support to an incident. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, when we uh, when we touch on the next uh, slide, I was uh, mm. we might have a bit of discussion around working with the large air tankers yeah, look, and that sort of stuff too. Thank you. Absolutely. Just this one that this slide that's on the screen at the moment, and I might get Mike to talk about it just from his mm. um, most recent experience. But one of the things that ground crews can provide significant information or advice to the air attacks and to the aircraft that are coming in to support them 
is what hazards they can see from the ground and wires are a major one. Wires, towers, um, wind farms, all that sort of stuff um, are things that uh, are critically important for pilots to understand and be aware of when they're flying around. Mike, do you want to touch uh, on that? Absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, I'll, I'll never knock anyone that gets on the radio and tell us it's a tower and they can tell me 10 times, that's fine. Power lines, swirl lines, single wire earth returns, they're the killers. Um, and there's a lot around here. You know, you'll get a property, uh, you know, a good couple of kilometres from a main road and a swirl line will run from pole to pole. And in an aircraft going around with different sunlight, they're really tough to see. And there's only a window of a very small time when you see the line. So if you go to a job and, and you guys see poles and you know there's a property, just please tell us. Just say, hey, have you got the swirl line that runs up that, va up, up that valley, up the hill? Um, and we had one last year. We had one at Pastoria and... Uh, it's so fast, you know, it, it happens so quick and it's, you know, it's life-threatening, um, you know, to all the aircraft, especially the, uh, the Helitax. Um, so, yeah, please tell us, you know, and once we've spotted the lines, we map them and we'll still find more. You know, you might see three and there'll be a fourth one or a fifth one and they're the ones that are going to get you. So uh, jump on the radio, let us know. Um, I think two um, high tension lines are not a big issue, but we won't go too close to there. I mean, high tension lines, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, obviously very high voltage and um, the uh, transmissions and things like that from those can uh, jump from us to the aircraft to ground. So that picture that you've got there, we we'll keep well away from those. Um, yeah, but um, let us know. Yep, and look, if you're requested, just can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the other thing that's on the slide there at the moment, if you are requesting or wanting some assistance of some sort, be clear about what you want. If you want it on the head of the fire, say so. Um, don't necessarily get bogged down with north, south, east and west. Um, it might be a geographic reference. I want you to anchor off that great big rock or um, off the corner of the road or something like that. Use some uh, things that are relevant to you that we might be able to see from the air as well. Um, upslope, downslope. Along the river, um, we don't drop in rivers, by the way, but um, you know all that sort of thing makes it quite clear about what you want. Instead of having to give some um, uh, vague request about what you need to be assisted with, uh, make it quite clear. Have a think about it before you ask. Uh, Ian, you touched on on the tablets. Um, we have the tablets in the aircraft now, and if we get a good email address from someone on the ground, and a, if, if there's a forward command vehicle, we can send a quick snapshot of photos around a fire perimeter. And you guys can get them back within minutes, um, rather than picking up. You know, first, I'll, I'll, picking up people and carrying around a fire is um, we don't need to do. We don't need to do that anymore. We've got technology now to do photos, upload them straight away from the tablet, send them into um, the command center, and you can re you can access them as a resource and uh, get them back to your command vehicle straight away. I think we did some at Pastoria. We right around the fire. And yep. do a whole series of photos right around the edge, how the line was holding up, where the dozer trail was. We can do that for you. Ask where we see gaps in dozer lines, um, where we think it's better to run a dozer line, um, where the air support's better on it, which side of the dozer line. You know, you might, uh, you know, supporting those dozer lines is really good with the aircraft. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, just, I think water is probably an obvious one. Pilots will find their own water generally because um, they can see a lot further than the guys on the ground. If you are suggesting a water location or a place where they might be able to load, certainly the helicopters, it would be worth scoping it out as well, just to have a look, going back to the previous discussion we just had about hazards. Are there poles? Are there wires? Is there a pump on the dam that might be needing power to it? All those sorts of things are the critical issues. So if you're seeing stuff like that, um, and even if you see a pilot going near a dam or an aircraft flying towards a dam that you're aware of or you had scoped out, tell them, as Mike said. Don't care if you yeah. tell us 10 times. Make sure we all know where the hazards are. And that, just touching on that, Ian, there's some great work at Pastoria. There was a dam right at the, uh, on the north side of that, that hill we were working on, and there was a line through, that, um, through the dam, and 335 couldn't work there, and the guys took the initiative on the ground, the crew's the initiative to pull that out, and I watched that come out without any request, and I thought it was pretty good. And as soon as they removed that line out of the water, 335 could go and work there. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> awesome. 
Um, working with aircraft, well, that's all we've been talking about. Um, I guess the key message here is that be aware that the aircraft are operating and that we can work together. Uh, but what the aircraft needs or what the ground crew needs to be aware of is that they can't drop where you are. Um, so we'll be, as an air attack supervisor, we'll be monitoring what they're doing and where they can go and certainly advising them if the area is clear. Uh, the key message there is that um, if you're releasing, and we'll use 335 as an example, three tonne of water at um, 80 or 90 knots, um, it hurts and it will bring branches down, it will hurt people, it will potentially kill people and damage trucks. So not the fact, not interested in the fact that we're all inside, it's all good, you can drop here, um, get the truck out of the way as well if there is a specific spot where you need working uh, the aircraft to work. But certainly they can work in tandem. Um, we might put a load along a line which will allow the ground crews to get in and do some work so you can tag team while they go off and get another load of water. All those sorts of things are quite possible. It's just you can't be on the spot at the same time. Um, <clears throat> this slide says, I think we're getting past it now, but a lot of times, certainly in the early days, people were as intent on taking photographs of aircraft, not worrying about putting the fire out um, as, uh, as much as anything. So um, photos are good, but the job is putting the fire out. There's stuff online that you can source, you can see. Um, you have access to um, uh, obviously YouTube uh, and the stuff online with um, the uh, through EMV where we've got yeah, um, um, packages. And Ian, as you've just touched on, uh, those further resources online on YouTube, uh, CFA EMV put out the working with aircraft. Uh, they normally do an update each year, don't they, of uh, just any other additional safety issues or measures that are coming up? So yep. it's a good one for good one for brigades. If uh, if you uh, jump online and you wanted to have a bit of perusal about working with aircraft a little bit further, uh, something I'd, I'd I'd encourage brigades to do. Well, we're hopefully heading in the right direction for COVID. If you're doing some training at brigade level, it's always good to if you've got the ability to run uh, some uh, and there's and there's some great footage online uh, from some of the media outlets uh, which I use in some of my rural shoots working with aircraft and. Uh, and you can, they've got some really good footage. Um, I just see a couple of questions that have popped up as we're getting to the end of this uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, from Len, is it possible to communicate with aircraft using uh, short emails via the tablet to avoid radio congestion? Uh, it would be cumbersome, to be honest. Um, we're probably eyes outside most of the time. Um, the tablets are a great tool, certainly from an air attack perspective. Um, it's a great way to convey a message and certainly photographs, stuff like that, of what's going on. Um, but uh, no, the, EM, the email addresses aren't on the tablet. No, no. Um, and one from Brian, uh, he read somewhere that uh, today that a number of aircraft will be fitted with live camera feeds. Will these be available uh, on FOVs, etc.? cetera? Uh, say that again. Uh, so Brian said he read today somewhere that uh, a number of aircraft will be fitted with live camera feeding or live camera feeds and will they be available uh, on FOVs, so forward operations vehicles, uh, like we've got at Golden Square and down in the Masson Ranges. So um, I suppose that is a yes. Uh, we had live camera feeds off some of our aircraft last year, but it's actually, th and you will be able to get it through your FOV, but it'll be through EMV. Yeah, look, absolutely. All that sort of stuff, that technology is available. If you've got capacity to uh, to be online in an FOV um, or even with a, a portable device, then um, this footage potentially can be available to you. And um, I guess going back to a point I made very early in the piece about different resources that we have available, the AIG platform out of Moorabbin um, can live stream in both uh, high definition and in infrared what's going on. And uh, the stuff in infrared certainly in a very smoky conditions, is gold, basically, to what's happening underneath the smoke column Absolutely. and the sorts of threats and potential that there might be going on. So um, uh, all that stuff is available um, and streamed through, well, mostly through the EMV website. Yes. Through EMCOP. Yep. Um, but, um, you know, there's capacity for us to, uh, uh, to send photos um, yeah, off the tablet as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
Thanks, Ian. And, and Mike, and we're just about to go to the next slideshow, which is around uh, a fire at Pastoria. And, and there'll be just some discussion around what the uh, AIG platform provided um, and, and how the tools all came together to support that, uh, to, yep. to support uh, that vision. Just one quick thing, Hugh, and, and just to jump in is um, drones. <laughs> Anyone <laughs> want drones? Fires attract drones. If you're at a job and you see them pull up and a drone come out, please let us know. As far as uh, there's been some really serious incident in Australia and in America where aircraft have been brought down by people with drones, uh, we will cease operations straight away. If there's a drone and you see, let your OAC know and to let us know straight away and we'll, we'll need to leave the fire ground until we work out where it is and it's been cleared. So, Yeah, absolutely. really good. Really good safety point there, Mike. Um, Peter Riley, I just saw that you had your hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, Pete, uh, do you have a question? Uh, your hand was just up. You might have just uh, knocked it. No, it mustn't be. So, yeah, Michelle, just wondering if, uh, if you, Mike and Ian's happy if we could uh, just go to the next uh, PowerPoint, please. Uh, so uh, the uh, scenario that we're uh, working through tonight is uh, around the uh, lightning strike that started at Pastoria in January of this year. And uh, it started uh, approximately about 17.30 hours uh, from, a, from lightning. Uh, a band of lightning had gone through and basically um, went uh, built uh, started to work up through the night. Uh, aircraft was called by the uh, crews initially uh, early in the piece. So we got to a point where uh, uh, last light was called and, and aircraft, unfortunately, wasn't available, wasn't able to be dispatched. But uh, as you can see, working in the Macedon Ranges, uh, and especially in the Pastoria, Cowboy area, there was lots of stringy bark, quite steep country. You can see by the uh, ground conditions, we had a lot of uh, heavy fuel on the ground. Uh, we also had lots of uh, lots of fine fuel as well. Uh, the season that we'd had, everything was really dry and, and the stringy bark was running from the base right to the tip uh, and slowly spotting. So there was a... Uh, a plan was put together with the uh, INS controller. We, uh, on the night of, I uh, believe it was Sunday night, I, uh, I went down to support the INS controller and, and, um, and, and work as part of the EMT with Forest Fire Management, Del Vic Pole. Uh, and we uh, we did have a lot of resources there because of the potential of it to come out of the bush and under the wind it was going to head towards uh, potentially if it got out into the grasslands, uh, potentially uh, work its way with that wind towards uh, Kyneton. We were successful in the night containing it uh, with some burning out operations and that well into the well into the night uh, into around midnight. And we we're able to hold it within the uh, within the forested area, which was actually private bush we discovered the next day. And um, if you could go to the next slide, please, uh, Michelle. So uh, the the next slide. So on the uh, on the Monday, there was some weather forecasts. So part of the planning was. The ground crews had stayed on uh, during the night. I went from being uh, out on the fire ground supporting this controller to uh, RDO two for the day. So in consultation with the uh, with the local group and the and the crews that were on the ground, uh, forest fire management uh, used uh, machines through the night uh, to put a D four D six. Uh, cut right round the fire as close as possible, but we all know in that country that sometimes we can be uh, hundreds of metres off the uh, edge. And with the uh, forecast weather coming through for Wednesday, Wednesday was shaping up, and you can see there we were going to have uh, severe damaging winds coming through right through the massive range of central part of Victoria. And then, of course, the subsequent forecast uh, on the Monday and then the Tuesday was we were planning for a total fire ban day with uh, with an extreme uh, rating up in the uh, up in the Mallee, and uh, and of course uh, the southwesterly wind change with those damaging winds, there was a great potential that this fire was going to get out. So on Monday afternoon after the weather, there was a discussion had between myself as RDO two, uh, the regional agency commander 
uh, who was Scott Purdy, uh, the rack and uh, the crews on the ground. And uh, th there was a plan hatched to uh, request that the IOG machine had, uh, was to be deployed to Pastoria uh, to, to give an overview. And if Michelle, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, an air observer had gone over it uh, over, uh, um, over during the day, uh, so at approximately about 10 o'clock an air observer had gone over the fire um, and there was, uh, there was some, some smoke coming, uh, quite a lot of smoke coming off. They had uh, plotted where they could see actually trees on fire, hot spots. Uh, so this was, uh, this was on the Monday and uh, at that stage after that discussion, uh, on the Tuesday, we started to put a plan in place. And, Mike, I think you were the uh, air attack on the Tuesday and the Wednesday, weren't you? Yeah, I was there the three, yeah. three so, days. Yeah. Yeah. So from from the, uh, from the uh, from, uh, what we had, we had approximately uh, 24 to 30 hectares, uh, which had been mapped uh, by the air observer. At that stage, we, we, we thought it was in that vicinity. Uh, a plan was put together, and we used... Uh, uh, an F band at the State Control Centre, and they uh, put together the a Phoenix prediction. And as you can see from where the fire was, uh, just south of Pastoria in the private country in the Stringy Bark, with the impending wind change and the weather, uh, the wind going uh, to the north, total fire band day, uh, it had the potential if it broke the control lines to uh, uh, run down. Uh, between Cobor and Newham and continue towards Hanging Rock and under the impending wind change it was going to go back and take the entire um, Cobor Ranges and go back to Lansfield. So uh, there was a discussion that day, Mike, on the Tuesday. If you could guess, Michelle, if you could just go to the next slide, please, and then we'll get Mike to have a bit of a chat. So uh, on the Tuesday, uh, Mike was working as the uh, air attack supervisor and the AIG machine uh, flew up and did some uh, an overview, flew overview of the uh, of the fire. And what they came up with, with all the red dots, were all the hot spots. Um, and as you can see, some of them were outside the uh, dozer control line. So if you could just uh, give us a bit of an overview, Mike, what you could see from the air on that day. Yeah, thanks. You sh sure. Um... It was actually the morning we went up. I was called really early. We actually got airborne pretty early to go up there. And um, it was fairly benign pending the wind, predicted wind change coming through and the, and the wind strength. But uh, the AIG machine went over the top and actually there was a lot of hot spots you couldn't see. There was a lot of underground burning root structure and also a lot of rocks and a lot of heat between the rocks. Um, those points picked out. Um, you know, once we started dropping loads in there, there was a lot of steam release and a lot of heat. And uh, we worked, um, I, I can give you the numbers, but there was a lot of drops made and a lot of them were into uh, really high intensity underground heat. And that's what was blowing out. And when uh, the wind started to pick up, that opened up and uh, away it went again. So it was just continual, um, a continual attack. And then the wind speed obviously picked up, but the Yep, onto the dozer line here, but um, you can keep going on that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I suppose the discussion was had. Uh, I trunked and spoke to Mike uh, in his opinion again. Um, uh, Eye in the Sky literally uh, suggested we need some additional aircraft to uh, hold uh, hold this fire. The slide or the shot on the right hand side shows the uh, heat signature. Um, and the uh, from there, Mike, uh, we, there was a decision made. Uh, yeah. that, uh, 344 wasn't the correct helitech that we needed. Um, uh, 335 needed to be brought down to be used for this job. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 344, a great machine, but the hitting capacity didn't have the impact capacity we needed to get down through the little bit of canopy that was there, but we needed a bit of penetration power, and 335 does that. With and, um, and, three, and for the for people online, 344, uh, it's dropping capacity approximately on that day. What was what would it be sort of averaging uh, drop-wise? Oh, you know, yeah, 1,600, 1,800 litres, something like that. Yeah, um, probably yeah. not that much, actually, Mike, probably not yeah. that much. Yeah, um, like maybe around a thousand liters, maybe even a little bit less, depending on on the on the. It was a hot day, and, and what about three three five? Uh, what's what's it uh, nominally drop? He was at, he would have been at three thousand, probably about twenty seven hundred something like that with the temperature. Yeah, yep, and and it was just making the difference. But uh, one other, if Michelle, if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So a decision was made after consultation with uh, with Mike as the air attack. Three three five was swapped over and was con- was holding Mike holding just just it was holding the lines. Three, uh, yep. three, three, three with the ground crew work. The ground crew work was fantastic. The dozer lines and the, they were getting around and three three five was holding the spots and flare up. So we were basically around the fire and the orbits. And there were hundreds of them literally going around and um, we just picked out targets as they kept breaking out. They didn't cross the dozer line. Um, there was a bit of a change in the dozer line on the northeast side there, and uh, we spoke to you, spoke to Scott, and we decided um, that's what Scott wanted to get get around the fire, and we asked for the lats, and I think they were deployed somewhere else, Ian, and um, oh, they yeah. were... Uh, yeah. So I suppose, Ian, um, uh, when, the, when I spoke to Scott uh, and we had a uh, three-way conversation with Mike and the decision was we needed a large air tank because we came up with this plan of where we needed the drops to go. When, we put, when I put the request into the state air desk, uh, a lot of people call or people call for large air tankers. What's some of the processes to get the large air tankers? Because on that day, Mike was right, they're actually en route to uh, the Northern Mallee to a reference area. And they had to be. Uh, they had to be. Uh, their, their their tasking was changed to come and support this due to the risk. Um, but if an RDO rings the state air desk and says, "I need the large air tankers," what's some of the things that have to happen before they can be dispatched? Um, well, the state controller, um, basically in the SCC, is um, the final arbiter of what the lats get used for, and uh, they prioritise or decide based on risk as much as anything. Yes, where they are best going to be used. Um, so a phone call from yourself to the air desk, the uh, state aircraft coordinator would take that request and walk around or across the floor to the state controller and go, right, I've got this happening, this happening and this happening. I've got these requests. Um, these are the issues. There would then be a discussion between potentially the um, uh, the state duty officers from the agencies as well about uh, what the, the hazards or the risks might be and how to go about prioritising the tasking. And uh, from there, essentially, it is the state controller that makes that call about um, what's going to be done. And I think, um, I mean, I've just brought this up tonight for people to understand uh, its controllers, crew leaders that are requesting uh, air, air support, uh, but also the large air tankers. Uh, when you put the request in, the RDO has to go through a process. And and on that day, I got a, a phone call from the state duty officer um, just to clarify that why we needed it, because the state re- response controller uh, on the day uh, wanted that further information, that 100% that we, we needed to retask the large air tankers. Uh, a thing that worked in our favour that day was the AIG machine was providing live footage back to the state control centre. And even though we had thousands of hectares burning, this was deemed to be the highest risk in the state on Tuesday because yep. of the potential, if it got out, where it would run and the damage it would do to uh, to the massive ranges. So, and I, think, and I think, Hugh, just on that, um, the request was like for two loads and it became... Uh, uh, well, you know, the coverage is uh, depending on, on terrain and um, and fuel, uh, you know, you might get 500 metres, if that, maybe 600 metres. But um, when we looked at it, we looked at how many loads, about, was it nine, eight, eight loads, I think, around that we did? Oh, yeah, um, I think we ended up getting three loads off, uh, yeah, three loads. Yeah. yeah. And we actually, the, to give people a bit of an idea, that line two, there was a, it was a downslope there and it was in the cleared area. So we copped it around a little bit um, counterclockwise and brought line two back around a bit and brought shortened line one and we just reinforced the dozer line so the retardant lines were put on the uh, outside of the fire over the running on, on the edge and of the dozer lines. Mike, uh, from your perspective, air attacking on that day, mm. uh, you had a couple of heli attacks in the large air tankers. Um, um, uh, when when do you become aware that they're, uh, they're, uh, they're inbound to your uh, job? The, the, the LATS, as um, Ian pointed out earlier, they have an air attack sit with the LATS down there. And so our role as the lead air attack on the job will hand over to them. So you'll see uh, us, we might pull out of the area and I'll send 335 out to go and get fuel or I might go and put down somewhere or go and hold out of the area while the LATS come in and I'll communicate with the LATS air attack. And so we hand over, we'll hand over that bombing run. Um, I'll brief the LATS air attack what we want. And um, once uh, the communications are set up and we know what the tasking is, uh, I'll go off 
and get that out of the area and let the let the uh, lats air attack work with the lead pilot to work out where the drops have to go and it's a you know you, you need to listen to radio it's really impressive they're total professionals and these guys work all over the world and they run that smoke run down and those large air tankers come in and um we're out of the picture there until they're done and out of the way yeah and and some of the a uh, couple of fire brigades uh i think it's tilden and it might have been newham fire brigades had some video footage from from the field of the large air tankers and you can get really good uh, uh visual again for your training sessions have a look at the uh, air attack platform that comes through it's puffing the smoke and the large air tankers coming uh coming through to uh put it down um i mean just uh quickly can the large air tankers split a load similar to the seats yeah, absolutely. They can. Um, depends on which aircraft you get as to just how much you get out of it. Uh, Eleven thousand litres out of the uh, the RJ eighty five, and about fifteen thousand out of the C one hundred and thirty. And uh, they can do all those things that you can do out of the other aircraft. They can split loads, they can restrict loads, um, so partial opening of the doors, uh, all that sort of stuff can be done. And I think um, I'd just like to reinforce that. Uh, this coordination of the aviation role, Mike touched on it earlier. The request was initially uh, I put in for was for two loads from the the large air tankers. Uh, but talking to the uh, the incident controller on the ground, divisional commander, uh, people on the ground, we got the intel back that the uh, the canopy had held up some of it, and it wasn't quite as as it wasn't quite as thick as what we'd liked. And that's when the additional request went in. So there's a real coordination between again, as the guys have been saying all night aircraft support ground crews the ground crews on the on the on the sunday night monday tuesday wednesday and subsequently for about seven days afterwards put in a huge amount of uh, effort and work uh and hard work on on hot days to contain this fire uh, to to the 24 to uh, 30 hectares, um, and it was it was a massive task, guys, from the ground crews, and you saw it firsthand. Actually, you, you just to jump in there. You touched on a a very valuable piece of uh, advice there, is that um, both the air attack and uh, mixing crews, whatever, um, rely on some feedback from the ground about the effectiveness of the drop. So if Ground crews are saying it's caught up in the canopy, it's not penetrating to the ground or um, it looks a bit light on or whatever it might be. Whether it be retardant, whether it be foam, etc., that information is gold, basically, so that we can adjust our strategies, the tactics and our loads so that we can provide the best, uh, best product we can to support guys on the ground. But we rely on that feedback. We can see some of it from the air, but... Um, uh, the actual effectiveness on the ground is something that we rely on in terms of feedback. And um, if we're getting that, we can do a better job as well. Fantastic. Um, Michelle, would you be good enough to um, go through the next slide? Um, I think uh, Mike might have touched on it earlier around the uh, the tablets. So the air observer was able to take some photos uh, and, and the air attack and provided that intelligence back to uh, 3AMCOP to the uh, to the to the deck where I was, uh, to the regional control centre where Scott and the team were working, and they were um, of course preparing for the uh, for the for the for the Wednesday, uh, which was going to be the the total five band day. And as you can see, if you're having a look at the uh, the slides that we've uh, got up at the moment, you can see the red smudges uh, in the photos. So that's where uh, where the uh, where the uh, air tanks have come through and laid it down. And uh, Mike, uh, was there a, did the uh, did the large air tankers do uh, one run after another on top of uh, the same uh, on the same run, or did they do one uh, in the, in the plan um, in the different directions? Uh, they they started at anchor point, and um, that was on the uh, downslope there on the western side. Here we first started, and basically what is the reason the retard's red is so we can see it from the air, and uh, the pilots can uh, join the dots. So the plan is lay the retardant down and then we caught tagging on. So our call is to 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 drop and then tag on, anchor from there, run it through there, correct? And then he'll finish his load. The next one come in, the 390 came in, the Herc came in and he'll tag on that load and extend. So we just tag on and extend and we like drawing a picture exactly the same, right around the fire like that. Um, and that's the best thing, the visuals, they can see the visual cues are where the uh, last drop finished. So in a perfect world, we want those to overlap. We don't want any gaps. So for you guys on the ground, people on the ground, if you see a gap, let someone know because we need to fill the gaps in. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And, and from, from here uh, the, uh, on the Wednesday, uh, there was a lot of work done on the Tuesday with, uh, with um, uh, an operations officer. Grand Observer crews had been out with the locals that identified uh, 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 properties and assets that could be uh, protected, where the pressure points were going to be. Uh, maps were developed, the incident control centre, planning. There was a lot of effort went into uh, into this job uh, really early, approximately, I think, about 7 o'clock on the, on the Wednesday. Uh, the weather, weather was on, on pattern to be uh, quite a, a tough Day. And uh, there was a decision made uh, just after seven o'clock uh, between myself, the state duty officer, and uh, and the RAC, the CFA RAC Scott Purdy, that we would um, get the large air tankers up to do one additional uh, drop each, just to strengthen those control lines. Overnight, the local crews, including uh, the green team, Frost Fire Management, had been working on that fire all night, and the outcome was uh, through a lot of planning and a lot of hard work. Uh, the fire did not get out during the day and was 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 quite successful. And it's funny, we, we we probably talk about the big fires and the fires that we go to, but I think sometimes we uh, we, we need to think about the ones that we do a lot of work on and, and contain because this one had the ability to get out and do a lot of damage across the massive ranges. Um, is there another slide, Michelle, or is that it? That might be it, I think. Yeah, that, that's it, Hugh. Yeah. So uh, apologies to everyone. We've uh, run a little bit over time again tonight. Um, but uh, just Ian and Mike, um, just in closing, have you got uh, some um, uh, something uh, to, uh, for, for people to take away, some learnings and, and things to think about around working with aircraft? Mate, I, I think probably the things or the criti critical things, the messages, the take-home messages beyond all the stuff we've talked about is that certainly from a PDD perspective locally, if the aircraft are, if you're aware of the aircraft coming, um, establish the fire ground channel. Make sure that uh, you've got that open communication happening right from the get go. And again, we touched on it a bit last week as well with Brett. If you have an objective and some strategies, etc., that you develop in terms of the firefight, that's gold to the air attack supervisor so that they can work with what your objective is. So a couple of key messages, comms, get them started and let the air attack know what, what you intend, what your strategy is, what your objective is. Absolutely. Fantastic. And Mike, what about yourself? Something uh, in closing to take away? Uh, yeah, just refresh on those aircraft safety videos and the online stuff and look at the uh, work on the fire line. I think that's a big one, you know, don't forget the first drop mightn't be the, the last drop and well, we might spit a load and be back over the top. So don't get complacent and walk off the fire line back into back into fuel and canopy again because there may be a second load coming. Um, if you don't hear a siren, let somebody know. There should be a siren activated every time there's a drop. And um, yeah, just refresh on that, on that training stuff and uh, leave, put the hose to the ground and walk away from the fire line, get back in the truck. And people should know the aerial identifier and the tanker they're in from memory without having to uh, look at the dash deck or, you know, if you're in trouble and you need a call for air support and, and you know, you're a, a, fire, a burnover, you know your aerial identifier. So that's, mean, a, that's a really good point, Mike. Yeah. Really good point. Um, your uh, our FCVs, our, um, our slip-on units, our tankers, uh, our aerial ID, because you can retask that uh, that uh, attack aircraft to support that truck that may need that. And so, uh, life firefighters, life first. Absolutely. And, so really good uh, tonight. Uh, so, guys, um, I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, e. McRae and uh, Mike Carney for coming on tonight. They've got a huge wealth of knowledge in this space. As I said, uh, my role as the aviation coordinator is to do that coordination, um, but I really lean on uh, these guys and, and the other guys that are in the team, aviation team, to support you guys on the ground. So from an RDO's point of view, um, we work really closely together and hopefully tonight you've got a bit of insight in uh, planning that uh, is undertaken to combat some of these jobs and, um, and and I think another thing is if you need additional aircraft call for it early uh, we can always uh, turn them around so again thanks to Adam for putting together the uh, slideshow 
work for us. Uh, Michelle is the technical guru and, and, and comes up with all the support. Um, I've got uh, I've got very limited uh, and uh, support. Uh, just a bit on next week. Uh, I've got a uh, Michelle's been able to uh, to get a, a 